Hey, I'm Jay Face of Rebel.media, and right now I'm with the social conservative, the one and only Brad Tross. He's the person, he's the man of the hour that is one of the most pivotal, um, one of the most experienced pro-life uh, candidates out there today. He's running for the conservative party. Uh, hey, Brad, how are you? Good to be with you today. I'm glad to have you on. I have a few questions for you first, but I just wanted to quickly talk about, uh, have you explain what the situation is in regards to the pro-life movement here in Canada and what the situation is legally speaking in regards to abortion and euthanasia? Well, legally speaking in Canada, uh, there is no law. We are one of a handful of countries in the world. I think uh, North Korea and Cuba come to mind as a couple of the others that has absolutely no law. And that's not because the Supreme Court says it's a constitutional right. It's because when they struck down the previous legislation, Parliament has refused to pass anything since then. So that's where we are legally. Politically, we have a variety of different groups that are on the pro-life movement. Most educational, a couple political, and uh, we have a lot of politicians who are, how should we say, personally pro-life is the way they would put it, but not prepared to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a lot of talkers, but not a lot of people willing mm -hmm. to take action. Yeah, so about that politicians being personally pro-life, but not politically pro-life, are you referring to candidates like Andrew Scheer, who has gotten support from the pro-life ca uh, caucus? You know, I'm not referring to anyone particularly. This could be federal, provincial, all across the board. I've been elected a member of uh, Parliament for over a decade, and I've had this line used on me, and you know, I'm publicly pro-choice, but I'm personally pro-life. Um, I can think of other candidates in this leadership race, and I'm not referring to Andrew, who have used that line. And from my perspective, it's very clear. If you think it's a human being, you as a government official have the right and duty to try to protect the human being. Because what is government for? It's protection of property, it's protection of liberty, and it is protection of life. And science is clear when human life begins. So I'm a government official, I'm supposed to protect it. One of the motions that was passed by, well, that was set up by Stephen Woodworth was to talk about whether or not uh, a law, could you, could you please explain what the motion is exactly and why it was shut down? Yeah, this was a motion brought in by Stephen Woodworth, member of parliament from the Kitchener area, and it basically was asking people to have a debate so that parliament could begin to decide, not, not, not parliament decide uh, scientifically, but for parliament to actually have some view and state, when does human life begin, what is human life, are we going to protect it? So it was a vote in the House of Commons, basically the NDP and the Liberals voted against it, but the majority of conservative members of parliament voted for it, with yeah. the Prime Minister opposing it. It was considered, quote, one of the more divisive issues in our caucus. That's the way yes. it's been referred to over the years. A lot of people saw it as a proxy for a vote on whether or not we could have an abortion law in this country. And uh, even MPs who didn't describe themselves as pro-life voted for it. So it's sort of the first vote on should we or should we not do something legislatively on abortion. And at that time, the majority of the Conservative caucus said yes. So let me get this straight. We have no law on abortion here in Canada. And then when someone tries to pass a motion uh, just to scientifically define what a human life is, it gets turned down mostly by the Liberal Party. Mostly by the Liberals, all, but also by the NDP. But about, I would say, 45, just under 50 percent of Conservative MPs also voted against it. And remember, that was in the previous parliament, not this current one. Um, it was interesting because it was one of the rare instances when the conservative cabinet was outvoted by the conservative backbench at the time. Yeah, so if we're going to have, uh, like, let's say, for example, if we're going to have someone like Andrew Scheer uh, get the conservative party ticket, do you think Andrew Scheer will be inclined to, like, uh, make pro -li the pro-life issue one of the causes and pass motions and um, actually, I don't know, move forward in the pro-life movement so we could at least have a law. Well, I can only judge by what he said. And in his opening press conference, he said that abortion is a closed, finished issue and he's not going to reopen it. That's his words recorded on camera in front of a room full of MPs and journalists. He's also referred to he doesn't want to have divisive issues in the caucus. And a lot of people, myself, members of the pro-life movement, believe that he's referring to the Stephen Woodworth motion, which uh, was previously in the House. So while Andrew has a perfect voting record as the member of parliament for Regina Clopel, those two things that he said very publicly on tape lead me to believe that he will not do anything at all on this issue. 
So, I mean, what's the significant difference between uh, having a pro-life candidate who has the ticket versus having someone who is, you know, Maxime Bernier? So, for example, I mean, both of them, Andrew Scheer has a great pro-life voting record, but just because he has a great pro-life voting record doesn't mean he's actually going to stand up for pro-life values when he gets the ticket. So, I mean, what's the significant difference between that and Bernier? Practically speaking, I mean, maybe morally that's, speaking, it's better to have them. The argument that I'm making, that just because you have a great record, if you're saying I'm going to abdicate this as far as leadership, um, you know, it's a good question. I mean, Maxime Bernier doesn't have a great record on this. I'll give the man credit for saying he's going to scrap uh, abortion overseas funding and he's going to permit a free vote. Um, but I think I'm better than both of those gentlemen on this issue because I've said, look, I do respect the free vote and caucus. But I will do things to advance the cause. I will not only um, talk about things to do, I will put fiscal resources behind things like making Canada better for adoption, doing things to discourage uh, abortion of uh, Down syndrome children. And I will fully support as government legislation uh, two measures that in the Conservative Party policy handbook. The Unborn Victims of Violence Act, always sometimes known as Molly and Cassie's Law, depending on which version, and our party's policy opposing gender selection abortion. Mm -hmm. How that would work out, I'd work with my justice minister and other ministers to do it, but that's conservative party policy, and that means I have the mandate of the entire membership to go forward on those issues, plus others. Do you think the conservative party right now is currently pushing away from the narrative that they're accepting the pro-lifers in order to get more liberal votes, let's, let's put it that way? You know, I can refer to our convention in Vancouver. There was four uh, pro-life measures, and I've got a, I don't even remember what they all were now. All four of them passed. So our rank-and-file membership may not be as pro-life as I am, but they do see that Canada needs a law, Canada needs some things to do to protect the uh, unborn. So it's not just me that's saying it, it's the delegates who voted in Vancouver on various measures. In fact, it was explicitly put in in our last party's constitution because the wording was a little vague, uh, pardon me, a little vague about gender selection abortion. The party voted to put the A word in and it passed by a solid majority. Mm -hmm. So switching it to a little bit of another issue uh, that is also a pro-life issue, uh, euthanasia. Could you explain to our viewers what the situation is in regards to euthanasia in Canadian law? Well, right now, the Liberals have passed uh, a bad piece of legislation. I mean, all of their legislation is ba bad. And for as much as publicly say there's restrictions, unless you're mentally ill or a child, it is basically if you want to commit suicide with the assistance of a doctor, you can have at it. Um, and there's not even conscience protection for medical officials who want to uh, say no to it. Mm -hmm. So we're in a situation now where it's pretty much whatever someone wants can go don't really have any ways of testing to see if they've been pressured or manipulated. They say people who want to make money off their will. So it's pretty much open season right now. And uh, it's causing issues. In Quebec, there was a problem with doctors refusing to treat suicide uh, patients, according to press reports. Um, so even things that weren't first thought of are now being affected by this bill. So right now, is it the case that anyone, uh, has, as, as long as they have doctors signing off on it, can receive euthanasia. And yeah, this is the reality that's beginning to be found out. As much as the law says there's certain protections and so forth, there are doctors and medical professionals, people who advocate for this, um, who are very much open and aggressive to signing off anytime, anywhere. It's sort of like the, the, the wink and the nod on medical marijuana. Uh, many people who weren't really that sick were getting it for medicinal purposes. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing here. As much as the law says you have to be in a certain position, um, if you can find a doctor who's willing to work with you on this, you can pretty much skirt the law if you really want to. That's the thing, because if it's physical pain, then we have palliative care and hospice care services that could deal with that and manage it well, or we have DNR orders, or we could, um, or we could just sort of take medication and morphine so that they ca they could pass away naturally, that kind of stuff. But if it's mental, then the question is a lot more complicated. 
Um, morally well, that's, speaking, that's what the push is on now because they put in, uh, and I forget the timeline, but after a certain timeline, it needs to be reviewed to decide do they lower the age to include children under this law? Do they make it for uh, people who have mental illnesses? Mm. I mean, neither children nor people with mental illness can make judgments for themselves. That's practically the definition of being a child or someone with a mental illness. Um, so how can you do that and say this is free, independent consent? That's the problem. In many of these situations, it isn't free and independent consent. I was at a rally opposing this bill on Parliament Hill, and uh, a doctor said, my job as a doctor is to walk people through the shadow of death and get them to the other side. And she said she'd seen hundreds, maybe not hundreds, dozens of her patients who wanted to die at the depth of their, her, of their cancer treatments walk through and say, I'm so glad you got me through that. What's wrong with our society that we aren't putting more effort into palliative care, that we aren't doing things to frustrate legislation like this to make it, if not impossible, next to impossible to be implemented? And yeah, that's the thing about these sort of cases. I mean, you look at the Netherlands or you look at Belgium or you look at other countries that have legalized euthanasia and they say it's just for this group of people, but they slowly chip away at the logic of the law and it affects more people as time passes. So you have people who are depressed euthanizing themselves or you have people who are in prison euthanizing themselves. They don't want to spend a prison service, so they, they go to prison. So sorry, they they'd rather euthanize themselves than go to prison. Um, and then that's purely because of the logic of the law. The law of unintended consequences when it comes to human life kicks in in a massive dangerous way. I mentioned earlier about reports in Quebec that people who attempted suicide, when they arrived at emergency, uh, hospital emergency wards, doctors were refusing to treat them. If you've read anything about suicide, you know a lot of people who attempt it don't want to die. They just want attention. They want someone to uh, talk with them. But like maybe at the moment they're sad or maybe at the moment they're depressed, but then they, once they receive help, they don't want to commit suicide anymore. They want to go through it. And here was the thing. Instead of fighting to save those people's lives, doctors were saying, well, the law is changing. I need to step back. The Quebec Medical Association, to their credit, stepped in and said, no, you cannot do that. And this is the thing. We need to do things as legislators, um, regulation. Right now, if you talk to the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, they say if you tighten the regulations on this, as a new government, you don't even have to pass a new law. You can shut down most of these euthanasias that are being pushed onto people. Um, give people hope. Don't give them uh, death. That's what we need to do in this country. Mm -hmm. And so... Going into that, there's a sort of like, let's say, people like to call it the culture of death, per se, where you have on one side the abortion issue, where you have the chip away of the logic of the law, whereas, oh, you can have an abortion for uh, sex electric purposes, you can have an abortion because that child has Down syndrome, you can have an abortion for whatever reason, doesn't really matter. And then you have the other side with euthanasia at the end of the spectrum end of the spectrum of life, where you have people, the logic of the law gets chipped to the point where anyone could kill themselves. Uh, anyone could euthanize themselves, basically. And so that's where we're at right now. Uh, and I call it the culture of death because that's literally what it is. It, you have on one side uh, children, uh, sorry, the unborns uh, passing away. And the other side, you have people who are elderly, or people who are sick, or people who are depressed, or people who are needy to ending their lives. Yeah, and a society is often and should be judged on how it treats its weakest. And people are at their weakest when they're near the end of life and when they're at the beginning of life. Um, it, society should not be about just the fittest surviving and the weak being purged out. That's wrong. That's why we created government. That's why we get together as people to support each other. That's what family's about. That's what society and community is about. Mm -hmm. And your elected officials need to fight. We need to figure out ways to push back on this culture of death. We don't just need to shrug our shoulders and say, well, the liberals passed it. Now we have to accept it. I think that's wrong. Do you think that euthanasia will end up being the same situation as abortion, per se, where, where there are no laws on it? I think it really has that potential, and that's why I think we're in this very crucial period. I look back to the 1980s and 90s when the abortion legislation was being debated. Um, you know, maybe if there'd been a little bit more leadership and understanding, we wouldn't quite be where we are today. It's hard to be judgmental, but I think now we're in a crucial phase. 
because the law is not completely formed, the culture has not completely decided that it's uh, part and parcel of what it's doing. So we need to move to do things to provide positive alternatives so people say, hey, someone cares about me in my dying day. We need to do things, even in opposition, we can push for very tight regulations, highlight situations of where the law is being uh, egregiously abused, and actually push this issue so that we do our job to defend human life. All right, are you optimistic of the future of the pro-life movement here in Canada? Because there is actually a lot of support for at least the law, at least some sort of regulation. Are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? We're, we're not gonna, we're gonna keep hitting a, a, we're in a rock and a hard place and we're gonna keep hitting a wall with this issue. Uh, I would say I'm realistic. Um, I can see that there is a lot of problems, but I can also see that people are beginning to try things. And I also see, and I've seen this both in Europe and in North America, um, younger people on some issues are more socially liberal, but abortion is not one of them. The millennial generation has not endorsed Hey, the look at me, I'm 21. For abortion. And <laughs> I'm so 21 years old, I, uh, for life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those cultural things, yeah. the desire for family and community among young people is there. I was reading an article in a British newspaper about how young people are rebelling by becoming conservative. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those issues. It's not an every issue. I'll grant on things like the legalization of drugs and things like that. The culture is getting more liberal, but it's interesting. It's not uniformly, and abortion is one of those things. History and culture takes a long time to move, and it's very gradual, but that's what the optimism I have. The baby boomers were very liberal on this. The millennials, not so much. All right, and uh, so this is the last question, pretty much. Uh, so who exactly do you think, I mean, who has your support? In, uh, so if we had a ballot, for example, who would you vote for and who has your support? As a, and this, I'm speaking not just as, you know, a, 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 from a news reporter to a politician, but from a person to person, a fellow pro-lifer to a pro-lifer as well. Who has my support in the conservative leadership race? Yes. Brad Trost and Pierre Lemieux. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for coming, Brad. I really appreciate it. You too. If you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe to the Rebel.media.